Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending June 10th, 2017. First up, this is from the University of Missouri, Missouri.edu. According to recent studies, declines in wild and managed bee populations threaten the pollination of flowers in more than 85% of flowering plants and 75% of agricultural crops worldwide. Widespread and effective monitoring of bee populations could lead to better management. However, tracking bees is tricky and costly. Now, a research team led by the University of Missouri has developed an inexpensive acoustic listening system using data from small microphones in the field to monitor bees in flight. The study published in PLOS1 shows how farmers could use the technology to monitor pollination and increase food production. They're also talking about that just average people could possibly use this device too, and it's pretty cool. I mean, just setting up microphones and uh, suppose you have a a large lot yourself or uh, maybe a wildlife area somewhere near you. This would be a great idea. So says causes of pollin pollinator decline are complex and include diminished flower resources, habitat loss, climate change, increased disease incidence, and exposure to pesticides. So pinpointing the driving forces remains a challenge. For more than 100 years, scientists have used sonic vibrations to monitor birds, bats, frogs, and insects. We wanted to test the potential for remote monitoring programs that use acoustics to track bee flight activities. First, the team analyzed the characteristic frequencies, what musicians call the pitch, the pitch of bee buzzes in the lab. Then they placed small microphones attached to data storage devices in the field and collected the acoustic survey data from three locations on Pennsylvania Mountain, Colorado, on Pennsylvania Mountain, Colorado to estimate bumblebee activity. <clears throat> so yeah, I guess you can sort out the, the beats of the uh, uh, bumblebee and hopefully uh, all the rest of the different bees and pollinators and stuff like that and separate them out. I guess with computer ana analysis and stuff like that, you can probably do some pretty fantastic things. As usual, all the links to all the articles, and there's a lot more than I just, than what I've read here, so um, check out these articles and the links will be down in the description below. And this next one is from my friend Dave N. Facebook is broken. The problem is this Facebook has become a feedback loop which can and does, despite its best intentions, become a vicious spiral. At Facebook scale, behavioral targeting doesn't just reflect our behavior, it actually influences it. Over time, a service which is supposed to co connect humanity is actually partitioning us into fractal, disconnected bubbles. I kind of think that to myself. It seems like the internet has more and more uh, polarized people rather than bringing people together because and I'm guilty of it myself too. When you uh, join a social site, a lot of times they will ask you what are your various interests. And if you uh, just put down like three or four limited interests, and they don't really give you a lot of material from, uh, you know, that you would look out outside of your interest, uh, then you could become just uh, forming little bubbles of people that think like you, act like you, and examine uh, even news stories and examine uh, life at large the same way you do and you don't expose yourself. Now, on, on my Facebook, I have made a concerted effort. I'm more of a centrist myself. Um, some subjects I lead to the conservative side, some subjects I, I lead to the liberal side, but I usually try to start out in the center and uh, give both ideas an honest shot and then see which one to me makes most sense. But um, yeah, what I have to do myself though, and I don't think, I don't think most people on Facebook probably do this. I I, some of my friends do, I know, but also I don't have probably normal groups of friends. I have people on the far left, people on the far left, far right, and everywhere in between. I have a few people that are centrists like me. I even have some people that are anarchists. So uh, just all kinds of different viewpoints. So I purposefully do that. And lots of times I'm having my friends on the right say, oh, why don't you unfriend this person on the far left? Or somebody on the far left saying, why don't you unfriend this crazy person on the far right? Well, you know, the only reason that I do this is, well, not the only reason, but I think it's, it's, it's an important reason to expose yourself from different ideas and realize people on the full spectrum can once in a while, sure, maybe somebody on the far, far right or somebody on the far, far left isn't going to have a huge amount of ideas over the year that you're going to probably agree with, but they still can come up with some ideas and they can come up with some input to things that, that make sense. So I encourage people. So, And the article says here, I'll read the last part of the article, the answer is twofold. First, they eventually construct a small in-group cluster of Facebook friends and topics that dominate your feed. And as you grow accustomed to interacting with them, this causes your behavior to change and you interact with them even more, reinforcing their in-group status and relatively isolating yourself from your friends 
and the out group. So um, they hoped that Facebook would be something better. Um, it says here, a rigorous study recently published in the American Journal of Epidemiology suggests that it isn't. Researchers found out the more people use Facebook, the less healthy they are and less satisfied with their lives. To be, to put it baldly, the more times you click like, the worse you feel. And uh, here's from a guy called Christopher Mims. No matter what else Zuckerberg does for the world, the simple fact is his product makes many millions of people worse off. Now, I, th I think it's also dependent on how you use Facebook, too. I think a lot of people, after a while, kind of wise up and are able to adjust Facebook quite a bit more to where it doesn't make their life miserable. I, I can't see that, too. Why would you um, just continually, if there's uh, people or things posted on Facebook and you can just uh, unfollow them and things like that, you can always do that to make Facebook a, a lot more enjoyable thing, too. But uh, I realize, too, there are also people that you kind of look at them and uh, complaining all the time on Facebook, and you're like, uh, is it kind of like misery loves company that they actually, you know, go out of their way to find posts that upset themselves? Uh, I don't tend to do that myself. I tend to get rid of those. And, um, anybody that posts a lot of stuff like that too, especially stuff like uh, if somebody that just seems to be obsessed with uh, animal abuse uh, videos and stuff like that, they don't last on my feed very long at all. <clears throat> and. This next one is from my friend Thomas H. The mystery behind a 40-year-old signal from outer space may finally be solved. This was back in 1977 at Ohio State University, the WOW signal. You've probably, if you follow the, the TDD report, you've probably um, seen this many times. And you'll, and you'll scroll down to the middle of this and you'll see the piece of paper with the signal with the circle around it and the guy going, WOW. Well, astronomer Antonio Perez has been studying the WOW signal for a long time. In 2016, he released a paper along with fellow astronomer Evan Davies suggesting that the signal could have been caused by a comet orbiting in the inner solar system. Specifically, the 2016 paper identified two comets, 266P Christensen and P2008Y2 Gibbs. They were both in the area where the WOW signal was detected. Both of the comets have large hydrogen clouds surrounding them that could produce the kind of signal detected in 1977. Paris spent about four months in late 2016 and early 2017 with a telescope pointed at comet 266P and found strong signals of the same type as the WOW signal. Paris also examined several other similar comets and found the same type of hydrogen cloud and the same type of signal, which means that even if comet 266P wasn't the specific source of the WOW signal, another comet is most likely the culprit. Now, as you know, if you're science, scientifically minded like me, you can't produce a negative. You can never say for absolute sure that the wow signal wasn't an alien signal but if you can prove that it's very common that certain types of comets and certain types of orbits emit a signal that is very similar or pretty much identical to what the wow signal was then to me just logic would tell you that it's way more likely that it was not alien signals so anyway that's about it for this week take care everybody i will catch you next week